Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And today I'm joined by Jack to do the top 10 decks for the Oceana International Championships, which is being held in a week's time. I'm flying out um, in two days and that's when it's all going to kick off and uh, hopefully it's going to be a good time. And we've got the best 10 decks from the standard format based on the last uh, four regionals and one special event as well from across the globe. So we're going to be running down these decks and talking about their favourable matchups, unfavourables and top techs as per usual. So Jack, let's kick off with number 10. Yeah, so starting us off, we have Sylveon Mill. There's going to be a couple of Mill archetypes we talk about. Uh, these uh, these have kind of proved their worth over the past couple of tournaments or um, over the past few months. Uh, Sylveon is uh, a deck that bases the whole deck. Uh, the whole deck is based around Magical Ribbon, pretty much. Just tanking hit with Magical uh, with Sylveon and Magical Ribboning for three cards to help disrupt your opponent. Uh, and the real big thing about these mill decks, including Sylveon, is they have a really good favorable uh, Zoroark or favorable matchup against Zoroark. Both Zoro Rock and Zoro Pod. Uh, are very, very favourable matchups. The Zorak players often have to uh, try and win the game very quickly against Mill decks. Uh, otherwise, they don't have the resources to outlast the the various techs or cards that the Mill decks play. Uh, so that's one big reason that people have been floating more and more towards Mill over the past couple of weeks. Um, it all started in Memphis. Unfortunately, none made top 32, but one made uh, just outside top 32. I think I believe it was 38. And it's kind of developed since. There was two in the top 32 of Leipzig regionals, including myself. So I do have a lot of ex experience with Sylveon. Um, and yeah, the, the Zoroark matchups are simply why you would play this deck. If you're able to hit four, five, six Zoroarks on day one, you are you should be winning the majority of them. And you should only have to win, ideally, one more matchup or maybe get some ties against some more difficult matchups to progress to day two. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why you're going to be running Sylveon. Unfavorables, the deck definitely does have flaws. The deck is designed to beat Tier 1, but kind of has more of a difficult time against Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, so you'll see that it has very good matchups about the against the decks that we talk about very later on in the um, video. But against things like Gardevoir, Volcanion, and Vikabulu, all of these decks have energy acceleration, uh, and that's kind of the one thing Sylveon doesn't want to have to deal with. Sylveon's really good at getting rid of one energy a turn, and when... The top tier decks like Zoroark uh, are only playing 7, 8, 9 energy. They can often keep up and run them out of energy. But with things like Gardevoir, where they can attach extra energy per turn and get big knockouts. Um, same with Volcanion having Baby Volk uh, attaching 2 energy. So even if you're discarding 1 per turn, they're getting a net gain of 1 or 2, um, depending on whether they attach. Plus they have Elixirs as well. That's These are the matchups that it's going to struggle with. Same with Vikabulu, especially as they also search their energy from the deck. So you can't even sort of get rid of their energy through Skull Grunt or anything like that. They're actually, they've actually got the perfect energy acceleration uh, to counter Sylveon. So these kind of stage two decks and or these energy acceleration decks are Sylveon's hardest matchups. Uh, you kind of have to have some good luck in those matchups. They're definitely winnable, uh, but they're not the matchups you want to see on the day. Top text wise, Hooper uh, was MVP this weekend. There were board setups that people couldn't deal with because of Hooper. Uh, and there were board setups where people just didn't have the time to deal with Hooper before they decked out. So I'd definitely try and tech in one Hooper, um, unless you're playing, unless you're deciding that you want to try and counter Gardevoir with your own 101 Gardevoir line. And in that case, I don't think you should play Hooper. So I think top decks, I personally would play Hooper. And I think Joe would, if he ever went anywhere near the deck, would play Hooper, uh, unless you're playing the 101 Guardi. But yeah, in general, I think it's got a really strong uh, sort of lineup against Tier 1. So if you want to take the risk and just try and hit all of these super consistent Zorark decks all day, um, it can definitely benefit, but it could also be a bit of a risky uh, day if you end up facing some of these Tier 2 decks that people uh, may decide to play instead. Yes, but on Sylveon likes a narrow format right towards the top tier, and for Internats, people are try-harding as much as possible, so could be a decent shout. Definitely one that's um, a much better deck than the results are showing. It's only really started to pick up in play, uh, since the decks start, since uh, Zoropod and Zoro Lycanroc have established themselves to be as good as they are, so it's one that's sort of picking up in popularity recently. Similar to that, we have the Hooper plus Wolves decks. Uh, I think it started off with Wishy Washy in Memphis. We saw that, I believe, get 10th place, 
and uh, a lot of heads were turned by this, basically, again, trying to prey on these Zorak variants by running them out of energy. And uh, in Leipzig, we saw this evolve quite brilliantly uh, by a few top European players. And um, they included a heavier, much, much heavier line of Wobbuffet. And in fact, three Wobbuffet breaks in their list um, because you jump up to 140 hit points, which means now you can tank hits from Volcanian EX, Zoroark GX, Galisopod GX, um, unless they have to use their GX attack, and uh, also Gallade as well, which is crucial. So some really big numbers being tanked by the Wobbuffet break meant that they had much more stable matchups against things where previously the wishy-washy wall list would be a lot less favorable. And uh, that's really interesting. So the deck has evolved to be very powerful. Uh, there was a couple, I think one actually came ninth as well in Leipzig. So um, very, very close to the top. And the other lists as well came in top 16. So not just top 32, they've been getting high up there and in touching distance of the top eight. Sao Paulo as well, there was one list that made the top eight. This was actually a Reggie Gigas Hooper list. Um, I personally would definitely go towards the Wobbuffet build. I think that's just uh, more likely to be the stronger build because you're much better against things like Vika Volt Tapu Bulu, which if you're playing the Reggie Gigas list, you're going to be much worse against. Uh, whereas if you have Wobbuffet Breaks, you force them to discard energy in order to take one hit KOs on you unless they're using the Baby Mew to copy attacks. So... Um, very, very good to have the really thick Wobbuffet break line. I think it's a dangerous deck. Thanks to the Wobbs being in the active, you have a decent Greninja matchup. Your Zorak variants are pretty good because, again, they can't deal with Hooper very effectively. And you also play a few counter energy for the few techs that they do use. Things like the little Rock Ruffs trying to spam on Hoopers. Uh, you can deal with that with counter energies as well. So very cool way of getting around these annoying Pokemon and I think the list has been perfected to the point where you can just pick up and play that 60 cards and have a decent chance if you face enough Zorak uh, decks. Yeah for sure I think Wob Break was one of the sort of most innovative things I've ever seen in a regional in the past year or so the fact it covers so many matchups is really really good right now uh, so this is definitely be another deck I consider if you want to go down the mill route the, the matchups are slightly different to Sylveon so uh, but I feel if you've played either of either of these two decks before, you could probably pick up the other one relatively easily as well. So if you have experience with one, definitely try out the other if you're going down the mill route. Next up, we have Greninja. Uh, it kind of always has to be in the top 10 because it is an inherently powerful deck. If it does get set up, um, it's a deck that a lot of people don't like because of how uh, sort of oppressive it can be when it gets set up. And a lot of people often write it off because it seems like it's super inconsistent. It's actually only as inconsistent as a regular Stage 2 deck. Uh, people just see it as a Stage 3 deck that is a little bit more inconsistent. But even so, it's always going to be pretty much in top 10s whilst it's in the format, just because Shadow Stitching is such a strong attack, especially when paired with 60 snipes turn after turn. Uh, Favourables-wise, things like the Stage 2 decks like Gardevoir are always going to be pretty favourable, just because uh, you have access to these really IHP Pokémon uh, in the late game, that only give up one prize, whereas their high HP Pokemon are giving up two prizes. Um, so that it's going to have a good time against some of these Stage 2 decks that are also as slow as it. Zorak Lycanroc actually is another relatively favorable matchup. Zoropod is kind of 50-50, um, but they have Grass types to back them up. First Impression is a really strong attack in the early turns, and then Armor Press pretty much from there on out uh, can be quite difficult for Greninja to deal with. Uh, but because you have Shadow Stitching... It means that Zoroark isn't getting uh, getting trades off, getting a huge hand size, uh, and Lycanroc can't be picking and choosing which targets it's eating up. And because of that, you actually have a more favorable matchup just because you have all of the things you have against Zoropod, but they're not hitting you for weakness. Uh, so it's a lot, a lot nicer than Zoropod uh, just because they don't have access to trade. And then, of course, Volk is a pretty favorable matchup. As long as you can Shadow Stitching plus develop a semi-decent board, they find it really difficult to one-shot the breaks. If you can pretty much get two breaks out, you should win that game just through tanking hits and trading up. Unfavorables, Goligarb is pretty bad for the deck simply because they have uh, ability lock generally before you do, and their main attacker is a grass type, so they're, they're not only stopping your abilities, uh, but they're also one-shotting you every turn with armor press, so you're doing barely anything with shadow stitching, and you can't increase your damage with Greninja Break, so... You, you're doing pretty pitiful damage against the 210 HP Pokemon. And Buzzrock is hyper-aggressive. In my mind, it's the 
hyper aggressive version of things like Zoro Pod and Zoro Rock. Uh, and Greninja does not like aggression. It can lose in the early turns. It's really reliant on having a good set of early turns. And if the opponent can just take three or four knockouts turn after turn after turn, uh, if you, they, they will have the time to take these last two knockouts. Buzzwall can also one-shot Greninja Breaks pretty happily. They only need one strong uh, with Knuckle Impact or Absorption GX in the earlier turns of the game. Uh, so they have a way of dealing with Greninja Break, which is often the big thing that Greninja likes to do. It likes to sit behind 170 HP, one prize Pokemon, um, and Buzzwall can, do, can deal with that. Top text-wise, if you're playing Tex, I think Max Potion is really good because it can help with things like Buzzwall uh, stop their early snipes or from meaning too much and sort of even stop them from taking semi, semi-big semi hits on two sh- uh, to go for two shots on breaks. Uh, you're all, you all have access to your energy because of, because of Starmie, so you're not losing out with Max Potion, things like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Max Potion is probably one of the best techs. But in general, I think if you want to play Greninja, especially for an Internats, you should just go hyper consistent. The deck is inherently one of the most powerful decks uh, when set up. It's tier, it's easily tier one if it got set up every game, just because of how oppressive ability lock plus snipe damage is. Uh, so I just want to do that every game I can. And if you can do that, you're going to have a much better time than the, I think, one or two games where you're going to have crazy swing turns because of techs. I'd rather personally play a hyper consistent 60 and make sure I am able to announce shadow stitching at some point in the game. Yeah, sounds about right. For me, Greninja's like right at the top of tier two. I think people won't be playing things like Giratina. There aren't any decks that really it makes sense to put it in. So you're not worried about just outright losing. And your unfavorables like Glycepod Garbodor is probably like tier 2.5 probably, I think. Not many people will be playing it. Only made one top 32 in Leipzig. So it's not doing incredibly right now. So um, I think taking Buzzrock as like a fairly bad matchup. Still one that you can win, of course. Um, if you hit enhanced hammers at the right time and if you can tapu storm away one big buzz well and get back into the game after that i think you could be fine so i think greninja doesn't have too many inherent unfavorables it's just the fact that it can trip over itself at different occasions and at an internet you need to have a pretty decent record for the amount of people turning up uh, to make top 32 so it really depends on your goals what you want to do with greninja if you're looking just to hit points it could be a really good deck for you if you're looking to go deep into the tournament, I think you may want to go for something a little bit more consistent. On two Garbodor variants, we've lumped them all together because it just felt so wrong to not have Garbodor in and around this sort of tier two area that it really does belong because Garbotoxin as an ability is just too powerful right now. When you look at some abilities out there like uh, Vikavolt, like Gardevoir, like Greninja, these are all decks in and around the mix right now and they are Seeing lots more popularity, like Vikabulu is becoming uh, a very highly played deck at the moment. Definitely one of the more popular ones uh, over the last couple of weekends. And it's starting to see placements as well. So people are optimizing those lists. So Garbodor is going to be really, really useful for those sorts of matchups. When me and Jack were talking, we figured that we think Buzzwall is probably the best way you can try and build the Garbodor list. We saw Mark Lutz get to top four of Leipzig um, playing a very creative list that he's not quite shown just yet, but he will do very soon. Um, And I think it was pretty much well set to win the tournament. He did face Vika Bulu in top four and um, wasn't able to win. I think he got a rough rub of the green, but I think uh, if that wasn't the case, he could have gone all the way to win the event, to be honest. I think it's a very, very powerful deck. Um, And just establishing Garbatoxin so strong, having the Buzzwell to support it means you need very little to get going. You just need simply a basic energy. Um, and then you just start spamming the elixirs, getting multiple Buzzwell on board, having Pseudo Wudo in the back as well to help skew prize trades and sometimes take big one hit KOs against other Buzzwell variants, for example. And once again, against things like Vika Bulu, if they do get a field blower turn, stuff like that. Even against Zoroark variants, when they hit their field blower turn, they hit you for Riders beating. You can go with Pseudo Wudo and take one hit KOs. So I think it's a really good deck. Um, I think it's definitely my favorite build right now. Glycopod has the inconsistency issues on top of everything else. And I think Glycopod Garb has an inherently really bad matchup against like Zoro Pod. It's okay against Zoro Lycanroc just because of the typing. You can sort of gain back and take free prizes at times. But I think against Zoropod it's pretty terrible. And that's not a great thing going into the tournament. So... 
Boswell seems to be the best play, and when me and Jack were discussing unfavorables, the only real thing we could think about was a Kiawe based Volcanian tech, uh, because Hoto is such a pain to deal with. And that's really it for Boswell Garb. It can, in theory, beat anything. The only real niggle is the fact that it may uh, simply trip over itself when it gets end to like a four or three card hand size. Can you draw out at that point? Because Boswell gets stuck via his own attack at times. That can be awkward. Um, did you draw into another Guzma? Did you draw into another uh, draw supporter, a floatstone? Stuff like that. These are the differences between winning and losing games. And it's sort of out of your control because although you're denying the opponent draw cards, you're denying draw for yourself. So that's the only real hiccup with Buzzgarb, in my opinion. Yeah, I think Buzzgarb is actually really well placed right now. And it's what potentially I would play if going to Australia. Um, like Joe said, the big thing is the big thing that uh, G- uh, Galispod Garb always had was that they could go five prizes ahead and the opponent could not take a prize, and they could still be end out of the game. And I think Buzzwall actually falls very similarly into that category. Um, just because you don't have the draw that other Buzzwall decks have, things like Octillery, Oranguru, because you're playing Garb, so you can't play any of those, you have to draw out of it. And as Joe said, because you can strand yourself with the attack, uh, it gives your opponent turns to get back into the game. Um, and it's it's very rare that at that point in the game, you'll, uh, you'll have more than one Buzzwall set up. So if they're able to... NU plus take your take out one of your only Buzzwalls that's set up. Um, it can kind of punish the deck for being too aggressive. Uh, so yeah, I think it's personally what I would play. Um, but I think it, you ha- you have to make sure uh, you want to take that risk at being end out of the game, which is still a very big part of the game right now. Next up, we Gardwa uh, sort of disappeared for a little while. Everyone thought it was dead simply because Lycan Rock, uh, Buzzwall, and Zorok Lycan Rock kind of. Uh, were able to deal with Curliers in the early game, and it kind of pushed Gardevoir down, even to Tier 3 in some people's eyes. Uh, But I think with the recent successes of various other decks, as well as the success of the deck itself over the past couple of weeks, means that it's actually back into Tier 2, probably high up in Tier 2 in my opinion, actually. The card itself is insane, obviously, so that's kind of what the deck is built off of. Vikabulu has always been a favourable matchup, similarly with Volcanian. And now you can counter all the Sylveon players as well that are trying to deal with uh, all of this Zoroark stuff. You can just, you'll, you'll never have a bad matchup against Sylveon, provided you don't get stage two things, uh, because you have access to Twilight, so you can shuffle 10 energy back in and kind of deny them ever being able to actually uh, win the game if they're not playing their own Gardevoir. Unfavorables, as I mentioned when talking about Greninja, Gardevoir doesn't have a great Greninja matchup if the Greninja player gets into the game. If the Guardi player goes off and manages to build two Gardevoirs that can deal with the breaks, then the Guardi should win. But it's just a case of kind of who draws better, but Gardevoir should I, theoretically have to draw better than Greninja to have a 50-50. Uh, because they have ability lock plus are uh, you're trading down rather than trading up. It's kind of awkward. And then Buzzrock. Buzzrock, uh, as we'll come to it, is in my opinion the most aggressive deck in format other than Volk right now, uh, or can be the most aggressive deck in format other than Volk right now, and uh, you, you can just lose the game in the early turns because you only run 60 HP basics, you don't start with this 230 HP, whereas Buzzrock starts with 190, uh, so you can just lose because they take out two or three of your early evolutions in the early game, meaning they only have three prizes to take on something like a Gardevoir or an Alele or whatever. Uh, which is a lot easier to do in the late game. So in general, I think Buzzrock is probably too aggressive. Uh, again, Gardevoir is like another deck where if you can get into the game, you'll probably have a really, really good time just because of how inherently strong the deck is. Uh, but I think things like Greninja are slightly stronger and Buzzrock shouldn't ideally let you into the game. Top text-wise, Double Gallade I think is still really strong. As you, We haven't mentioned a Zoroark variant yet and we're halfway through the video. Uh, so you know Zoroark is definitely coming up, and Gallade is such a strong card against Zoroark. Being a non-EX that lives a Zoroark hit, that also kills Zoroark, is insanely good. Um, and Premonition is still a crazy good ability, just let, giving you that extra consistency once you've got it out. So I think Double Gallade, or Second Rescue Stretcher, if you want to have the versatility of being able to uh, grab another guard of why you've had to discard in the early game and things like that, also another good card against Mill, just to keep keep the cards ticking over, keep your deck ticking over. All you need against Mill is time, 
uh, because if you have access to Twilight Jex, as I say, you should win. Uh, so yeah, I think either Double Glade or Rescue Stretcher should ideally be what you play in your list. I'd play Double uh, I'd play Double Glade if I was playing it. I would not play the 444 DNC Moo Moo Milk build. <laughs> I think it's crazy. I think it works for the tournament, but I think in general you should stick to your rare candies, stick to getting out Guard of Wars turn two through the rare candy route, um, and go with a list similar to Tommy's or Tubbs this weekend, maybe a slight change on the item counts, uh, kind of combining both lists in general, but there were two lists that did well at Leipzig this weekend. What Three made top 32, and then Tommy made top eight. So I'd just take a look at the recent list that did well at Leipzig um, in general. Even though the Sao Paulo list won, I personally prefer the list that did well at Leipzig this weekend. Yeah, I'd probably say the same. I mean, Rare Candy's been a staple in Stage 2 decks for generations, and there's a reason for that. And I think the Sao Paulo list is pretty crazy for a lot of reasons, but I think it needs definitely tweaking uh, in a big way. I would, I actually quite like um, splicing Ryan Morehouse's top 32 list alongside Tommy's. I really like the 2-2 Octillery list. Uh, that Ryan played. I think that was very, very threatening. I think you'd have to trim away some max potions, maybe just play two or three maximum um, to still give you help against the Zorak builds. But the second Octillery being in his list in the games I played against him were incredibly powerful for getting it on the board early. And also when it's knocked out, you have a new way of reloading. And oftentimes there are plenty of decks that need to stifle Gardevoir's late game. And oftentimes it involves denying the artillery especially when you have double glade in the list you have premonition artillery and it's just a filthy combo when it's on board so that would be what i would look to go for with gardevoir still a very strong deck for sure and is something that can deal with mill which is also like pretty cool i'm happy about that <laughs> on to vikavolt tapu bulu this deck is all over facebook groups <laughs> and everyone has a different opinion of the deck um, the list that came second in Leipzig was traditional with Orangaroo, uh, Lele's Bridget's Heavy Balls and all that good stuff. The second place list in Sao Paulo was the Kika Bulu version that played Lilies over Bridget's and played Nest Balls. I've made it clear very often that Bridget is too important to play in a stage two deck to not do it. So you should be playing at least one Bridget, I would say two minimum. Uh, because you need to get multiple Grubbin on board. If you're playing the list that only plays Nest Ball, there are more opportunities for you to whiff the chance of having multiple Grubbin on the board. And against things like Buzz Rock and Zora Rock, especially if you go second, it will lose you the game, like, almost every time, because they will just Lycan Rock deal with the Grubbin very, very quickly, and straight away you're into game two. So that's my thought on the build. But in general, Vika Bulu looks very strong right now. Um, it is based on a stage two, and its matchups plummet when you don't get a turn two Vika Vault. But in theory, it should have very favorable Sylveons, uh, pretty good against Greninja, and also good against Buzz Rock, as long as you do develop your Vika Vaults ASAP, and you can then race them down quite effectively with your Bulus. Unfavorables, Gardevoir, still going to be a pain. I don't think it's worth really teching in multiple Kakui. I think maybe like two as a maximum if you're really concerned about Gardevoir because it is kind of on the rise once again. And also Garbodor variants. The Leipzig list that came second played three Field Blower as well as I think two Skylar. Um, I think it's reasonable for you to only play two Field Blower if you still have a high Skylar count. Uh, but if you're feeling nervous about Garbodor, you can go all the way up to three as we saw, it did very well. And for top techs, I like the Mew. Mew means you can one hit your Wobbuffets without discarding energy, which is actually important because Mill is going to be around, I imagine, uh, for Oceana. As well as the fact that you can deal with Buzzwalls on a nice two for one swing uh, without needing things like Choice Band. And they have to deal with a Mew. It's a single prize Pokemon that's a big, big threat for them. So. And on top of everything else, it can use the attack and counter if you're dead drawing and get you out of it. So there's no reason to not like the Mew. It even helps you pivot with Guzma. So there's everything everything all wrapped into one card that you can play in your list. So it's a pretty much no-brainer to play this card in the deck, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think the only thing I want to say is about the Mew. It seems so strong right now. Uh, we've talked about Buzzwall already in this video, and we're going to talk about it again. 
So being able to counter Buzzwold is really, really important, especially when uh, they're going to try and race you down. Being able to get back into the game with Mew is super important right now. And I'm glad you mentioned the pivot as well, because Vikabulu is another deck that when it gets set up, uh, often likes to pick and choose where it, where it takes its prizes and means that Guzma is often uh, the uh, support of choice. So just ha- it means you don't have to rely on float stones and not getting field blood and all of that stuff. Just having the Mew down is super simple. Um, plus you can copy some really weird attacks as well. You've got like having that ability is just you're going to find weird situations where you're going to be able to copy a energy drive, energy drive or whatever as well. So it's super strong right now, and I think Vikabulu. Uh, is one of the decks that seems to float in and out of tiers, like two, one, one, two, and three. It's always floating. It's never, it never stays the same in the same place. Uh, but I think it's, it, I think it's definitely in the best place it's been for a little while. Next up, we have Volk. This is a super aggressive deck right now. I think uh, I really like Volk builds right now. Uh, favorables wise, Galissapod Garb. Obviously, that's probably not the Garb variant you're going to be seeing. Um, but in general, Volk is kind of a 50-50 deck that is just that just relies on aggression. Uh, but it does have really good matchups against Glisspod Garb and Mill decks if you know what you're doing against Mill. Um, in general, people think Mill is like an auto win. It's not unless you've played five games against Will Mill. As soon as you've learned what to do against Wishy Washy and Sylveon, you should win the game. So just take take an hour out of your day, play against five Mill decks. You'll hate it, but you'll never lose to it on the day. That's all you need to do, trust me. Uh, unfavorables wise obviously Gali has always been unfavorable for Volk you have to go hyper aggressive and try and push them out of the game early because as soon as they develop a board they generally win so you really have to push them out of the game or get some really strong plays with Turtonator Turtonator is kind of your uh, one one win condition against Gardevoir because they have one. you have 190 and discard your own energy and do a bit more damage than Volk's uh, so yeah if you're playing Volk and you are expecting a lot of Guardi. I'd definitely add in a second turtle if you're not playing it already. And obviously Greninja, as I mentioned when talking about Greninja, isn't a great matchup. Uh, top text, energy retrieval. I really like the energy retrieval build right now just because, as I've said, it's hyper aggressive. It means you can go real, real, real big on uh, power heaters. It means you can actually start two shotting with power heater rather than setting up and then taking a knockout later on with volcanic heat or anything else like Turtonator or whatever. You can actually, with choice bands, go really aggressive with um, your steam ups and stuff and still set up for a strong late game. Uh, so, yeah, Energy Retrieval is really nice. We haven't talked about, we haven't said top text wise um, the about the tool of choice because it's really up to you. It really depends on what you think you're going to see. Uh, Vault, uh, it has a pretty good time against Zora Errant if it's playing the um, choice band sort of build because you have need one less steam up uh, and you're able to trade pretty well uh, but it sort of struggles with some of the other variants whereas if you're playing fury belt having that little bit of extra hp uh, even that even that 10 damage is important so having access to 10 damage plus having that extra 40 hp can swing certain other matchups so it's kind of like what you're expecting to see i'm still expecting a huge amount of uh zoroark in australia so i personally would play choice bands i think um, I'd also probably, rather than go Oranguru, uh, I would still stick to Sushi uh, Sushi Volk just because I really like Octillery in the deck. Uh, I really like how much uh, Brooklet Hill there is around right now, and being able to abuse that, even being able to take one or two of your own out, just because you know people are you know you're going to be playing fighting decks during the day. Uh, you can actually probably go down by one count to give yourself an extra slot. I think that's not at all unreasonable, um, and just having access to potentially double octillery is insanely good uh we talked about it when talked about talking about guardy having two octillery just wins games outright and it's the exact same in volk when all you want to see all game is fire energy just drawing an extra three four five cards per turn uh it's, it's just ideal the other option is playing kiawe and going for a heavier ho build um that we saw uh do well in leipzig there was two in top 32 in leipzig uh the lists are out there if you do want to try it out this is an, another really aggressive fire deck. It aims for the turn one Kiawe onto a Ho-Oh uh, to start taking prizes from turn two. And again, you just want to push people out of the game as early as possible. In general, I think I prefer the slightly less aggression of uh, Volk, sort of Baby Volks, because you can still be aggressive with Baby Volk, uh, but you have that built-in sort of um, reliance of being able to set up and 
attach from the discard and not worry too much. 130 HP is still really annoying on a non EX, uh, so it's always going to be an annoying prize for your opponent to take. And if you force them to take two, uh, that's going to expend a lot of resources that they're ne- then not going to be able to have to deal with your Volcanians, your Turtles, and the later stages of the game. So personally, I think old school Volk with choice bands and sort of um, auxiliaries is how I would play it, very similar to the list uh, that's on the channel from a couple of weeks ago, I believe, that has uh, all of these kind of things that just make Volk try and draw as many cards and just announce Volcanic Heat uh, multiple times during the game just because you're, all you're seeing is fire energy. <laughs> I think Kiawe is a little bit too a little bit too risky in my opinion, but it's done well in the past and Kiawe is a really strong card, so definitely both variants I think are in good space, in, in good spots right now. Yeah, there's merit to both builds. I think if you're playing the Kiawe build, essentially you're taking the Sack to Guardi, but you're winning against Buzzwell and the Zorark vet, uh, decks way more. So I think if you want to freebie Buzzwell and Zorark, I know it's not really a freebie, but really making those at least 65% win rates, um, the Kiawe build's the way to go. I think regular Volk is more towards the 50-50 bracket, uh, but it then has a closer matchup against Gardevoir. So it's down to you based on whichever you whichever direction you, you want to go. Do you want to try and dodge Guardi and just go all in and hit the other good matchups? Or do you want to go closer to 50-50s and hope that your skill can take you there? It's up to you, but I think both lists do have a lot of merit. From what I saw in Leipzig, there was really only like three or four pilots of the Kiawe build, and two of them ended up making top 32. One got very close to top 8 as well, so... Uh, definitely merit to their build, and it's another one that I would suggest checking out for certain. In at number three, we have Zoropod, my personal favourite deck of the format. (laughs) And, um, well, at least it was before Mill turned up, pretty much. (laughs) Uh, I think this deck, when we look at favourables, unfavourables, I mean, it's really weird. When you look at um, other people's matchup spreads who made, like, top eight, you can see that certain decks are beating Zoropod. But then from my own testing, for example, things like Buzzwell, Lycanroc, or um, things like Volcanion and Vikabulu. I'm 100% against Vikabulu and Buzzrock in tournaments, and against Volk, I'm like 50-50. So um, I think this is literally a 50-50 deck. It has the tools to beat anything just by outdrawing people and being able to hit your Acer Rollers and Guzmas on the important targets in the early game. Um, doing the efficient attacks of first impression, grass typing still very relevant for Greninja and all the Lycanroc popping up. You can, although the fighting decks have weakness on your Zoroarks, you can have weakness on them with Glycopod, so it is fairly balanced. Having armor press means you can get pushed out of one Nikio range against Vikabulu as well, so it's much better against the deck than Zoro Lycanroc, where Bulu can easily one Nikio the Lycanrocs and uh, doesn't have to discard either. Uh, so there's a lot of intricacies to Zoropod. I think, personally, in my eyes, it's better than the Zoro Lycanroc, but results <laughs> sh- say a different thing. Um, it has got two first play finishes in regionals, not the most recent ones, however. And interestingly enough, it's sort of uh, more towards the top 32 line in the most recent regionals, whereas earlier on, it was more towards the uh, top 8 bracket. So... It's a deck that's being countered more and more. More people are going towards the decks that do have answers to Zoroark. Like we're saying, it's 50-50-ish, but there's more of an incentive towards things like Vikabulu and Volcanion because they can have an at least 50% matchup, and that's what's important. So definitely a deck that's on the radar, one that everyone wants to not lose to going into the event alongside the other Zoroark variant that's very popular. And for me, I think you can still play Zoroark, to very effective finishes as long as you don't face mill and mill is the big headache for you will it turn up in australia and if so is it going to be five percent or is it going to be ten percent or maybe even higher that's the big question mark for me going to the tournament personally being a zoropod player for maybe like two months now um and it's something that can dissuade you from playing the deck but otherwise i think the deck is just inherently insane the fact that you can beat people just with hand advantage alone is just incredible. So I'm still in love with the deck. I think it's top tier. And uh, you just got to dodge mill if you're going to the event. Yeah, if you can dodge mill, you should be in a pretty good position. The deck is easily the 50-50 deck of the format right now. 
And we've seen kind of over the past year, I just know from sitting here listening to what Joe's just said about 50-50 decks, we're always talking about them in the top tiers. So being a 50-50 deck is always a super good thing to be. Um, I think that the big thing with Zoropod right now is everyone knows about it. Right when it first started showing up, especially just after London Internats, people were losing to it because they they didn't know what to do against it. But now you can we can see from the fact that people are playing Mill that they know about Zoroark and they know how to beat Zoroark. So it really comes down to, in my opinion, yes, the deck is really strong, um, but it's it's whether you want to run the risk of no, everyone knowing how to beat your deck and you just drawing better and playing better than them, or whether you want to play a deck that maybe people won't be as aware of but maybe isn't as consistent. So I think players that have been playing Zoropod for a long time and haven't really, they maybe tried other things, but have in general been playing Zoropod or Zoro Lycan Rocket. This is this goes, um, this is the same for Zoro Rock as well. Should probably stick to Zoropod because they will win through their own skill. But I think if you haven't played Zoropod ever or you haven't really played it much at all, I think you're probably going to do better with another deck simply because Zoropod, I think at this point in time, now relies more on personal, uh, like player skill rather than drawing a load of cards and just winning through being able to have a 10 card hand and that kind of thing it will win games through that but i think in general uh, you have to be more skilled with the deck now next up we have the other zoro zoro variant zoro lycan rock this is personally my preferred zoro rock variant um i haven't played it anywhere near as much as zoro pod uh, but i just love lycan rock gx right now again it's another 50 50 deck and that's a really good thing for an internats if you just want points from an internats internats are broken this year so you should just be going for points from them ideally if you just want to coast it to worlds if you want to go for top 22 or top 16 etc that kind of thing um maybe you want to be looking at going deeper in the tournament but if you just want to guarantee yourself some points Sorak is never going to let you down really provided you don't have some stupid luck against mill all day um, like I say, favorables are 50-50. The matchup thread is slightly different than Zoroark uh, Galissapod, but we didn't want to go into it too much because the decks are inherently very similar. Um, or the decks are quite different, but the matchups in general, you just want to be building Zoroarks, building a board, drawing lots of cards, and winning through uh, having hand advantage, as Joe said. So we didn't want to go into the ins and outs of each different matchup that's slightly different between the two decks, because in general, probably as a group overall, they are very 50-50 decks. Similarly, Mill is a worse matchup. Uh, you do have you know, a bad matchup. You do have a better time against Mill as Zoro Lycan Rock. I believe this is much closer to the 50-50 mark than it is against Zoropod uh, because you have things like Baby Rockruff and you should be playing more basic energy than Zoropod should be um, or you should be playing a similar round, but you should have more energy. So in general, it, it is a little bit harder. Some people have talked about playing uh, Baby Lycan Rock. I actually don't think it's... I don't think it's insane. Like I don't think it's a crazy good tech for Mill. Uh, I actually am as pretty much as scared of a baby rock as 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 I am as a of a baby life and rock. So I think it's better as another card for a different matchup. Um, but yeah, you definitely even though Mill is definitely unfavorable, I'd rather be the Mill player. Uh, but I definitely rather see a Zoro Pod than a Zoro life and rock because they can be more aggressive through bloodthirsty eyes and they and they do have a very good out to um hooper whereas zoropod just doesn't top text wise basic fighting energy seems like a really simple one uh but if you're playing two or three of these instead of um it, it, essentially i think you should flip flop your ba basic fighting uh for your strong count i think you should play four dce three basic fighting and two strong strong is a really strong card um says it in the name and being able to affect some numbers with dangerous rogue and claw slash along with also having choice bands actually will win you games uh but basic fighting energy one is going to be better against mill decks because they're much harder to get rid of two it's going to be much better against the, all of these decks running e-hammer right now um zoropod is still running e-hammer so just having more fighting energy uh to avoid getting e out of the game is still good and three it means that you still have access to lycan rock and lycan rock is still a very good attacker um it's doing as a lot of the time it's doing as much damage as Zoroark, if not more, with Strongs, uh, plus Dangerous Rogue. Always having access to Dangerous Rogue is still really strong. You can see from the results, um, it is being represented. It's being, it kind of dropped off during the Turin special event, 
but in general, it's it it won in Memphis, so we know the deck is good, and people are still wrapping it. There was still four in top 32, and one in top four, and one in top eight in Sao Paulo, um, and another in top eight, and three in top 32 in Leipzig. So people are still wrapping the deck. It's my personal preferred Zoro variant, um, and I'm definitely going to be playing around with it a lot more. Uh, but I think both Zoro Pod and Zoro Lycan Rock are in, still in really good positions right now, even though people are teching against them. Uh, just having, just being able to draw a lot of cards and draw into your answers will still win you so many games. Yeah. So before we go into uh, our first place, just a quick note that if we were to put both Zorak variants together, they would be on top. So the debate yeah. is up for grabs, who's the best deck, but we decided to split Zorro, Lycan Rock and Pod just for the sake of getting it into a top 10 list rather than just having a deck that really doesn't belong on a top 10 list on the list, if that makes sense. So that's why we've made the split there. Here we go with our number one deck for Australia. It is going to be Buzzwall Lycanroc. It's the deck that just won in Leipzig, also claimed a nice top four finish in Sao Paulo, and uh, has done very well since Memphis. Well, actually since the London Internationals, where it also uh, sort of first showed up. It's consistently cutting 10 placements in Sao Paulo, is absolutely absurd, and six in Memphis as well, so... Really, really powerful deck. Loves its early aggression. Jet Punch is an insane attack. Whilst you're also stacking energy on your bench. Uh, splitting between uh, Rockruff and Buzzwell to give you multiple options. Thanks to Max Elixir. And even some playing multi-switch as well. To make sure you can get these big knuckle impacts and absorption GX attacks going. Uh, you also have the Dangerous Rogue option as well available to you. Uh, having two different weaknesses as well with Grass and Psychic can... Mitigate the fact that you can be weak to techs like Mew EX and Mew2, uh, as well as Golisopod just being in some decks in general. For favourables, it looks like Greninja and Gardevoir are quite easy to deal with just because of early jet punching. Uh, not only is it 30-30, oftentimes you're getting out Regirock and Strong Energy, and you're taking one Hikios on little 60 HP Pokemon, whilst also forcing the opponent to evolve things on the bench as well, to hopefully take multiple prizes throughout the game. And even if you're not taking prizes, you're setting them in range for later on. So very, very decent first attack. Great pressure for the deck. And then simply you have the Lycan Rock that can dust things up into the active as quickly as turn two to make sure you're, again, hitting some of these Pokemon that really are high priority targets. Hitting them before they hit you is essentially the way that this deck wins because you're dealing with the threats much more efficiently than they are. And at the same time, you're typically using things like Brooklet Hill getting an artillery on board as well so that you can end proof yourself in the late game because you are more than likely going to be going ahead in prizes when you are playing the Buzzwell variant. As we said, just because of Jet Punch being so strong as well as Absorption and Knuckle Impact being fantastic follow-up attacks as well going into turns two and three. So definitely just a really powerful card. He's been complemented very, very well by this Brooklet Hill package and having these other stage ones in the list. Very, very helpful. For top techs, I think Carbink is reasonable for this list because you can flip your mill matchups to be very good for you. And uh, also Bridget's a nice card that I've been considering. I know that Mahone in his top uh, four Memphis list was playing a split of Brooklyn Hills and Parallels. Parallel is an insane card in the format right now. Very, very powerful. So if you are wanting to play Parallel, you can go down a line where you play Bridget so you can still get Rockruff. Remoraid and Buzzwell all on your board turn one. Um, very, very strong. Brooklyn Hill is, of course, an amazing stadium card. You can still play it, uh, but having an additional, maybe just a single copy of Bridget could be a great way to go, Just especially if you go on uh, turn one, going first. Bridget's so much better than going for like Brooklyn Hill plus Sycamore or something because you don't need to use the Elixirs that turn and you don't need to dig for anything other than just basic energy attachment. And when you're playing like 13 because you're playing an Elixir deck, you're going to have an attachment in hand more than often. So um, I really like the Bridget uh, being played and tested out for the deck. I think it could be very, very strong. So overall, just a very powerful deck. It's got at least a 50-50 against Zoroark builds. Everyone's teching Mew EX and Mew 2 to try and make it as hard for you as possible. But um, the Mew EX can be a two for two. All it really does is strain your energy and make sure that you need to hit Elixirs. So... Maybe even playing just 10 basic energy to hit elixirs that much more often could even be like a quote-unquote tech card that you can play because 
Really, the deck is very focused on Max Elixir. It can win games just by hitting like three of your four, lose games just by hitting only two of your four, for example. It is very all-in on attachments. That's the only thing dissuading me from maybe playing it in Australia. But other than that, it's just a super powerful deck that just hits too damn hard right now. Yeah, it's a hyper-aggressive deck. It can go into the late game, but I think in general you want to kind of have um, an early game sort of super aggressive win with this deck. Uh, Burt obviously won this weekend, which I think is why everyone's considering it a little bit more. As we said when talking about Zoroark, if we lump Zoroark together, Zoroark variants would be number one. Uh, but I think if we're splitting everything up that we're likely to see if you're considering them two different matchups, which I think you should, I think Boswell Lycanroc as a, in a vacuum is the strongest deck right now. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we've gone for as number one. However, if you haven't seen your favorite deck, maybe it's on this page. Uh, we do still have some sort of contenders outside the top 10. Xerneas Break is obviously a personal favorite of Joe's and a lot of the complexity guys, and even me now. I've been persuaded to start playing it, and it is a lot of fun. And it can hit like a truck. Um, being able to resist Zoroark on a non-EX and one-shot Zoroark at the same time is crazy good. Uh, so you should have a good time at Zoroark variants. The deck in itself can be inconsistent at times, um, but I think it's definitely a cool deck to try out. Uh, one made top 32 this weekend in Leipzig, um, so if the re if the list is released in the next few days, make sure you keep an eye out for it. But if not, uh, there's a lot of lists about, especially a lot of lists from us, unfortunately. So take one of those. Make sure you've got yourself covered for various different decks you're going to be seeing in Australia, uh, and give that a whirl. Yeah, if you want to just face Mill and Zoroark, it's a great play, but there are still some hiccups for Xerneas out there. Um, then in the center of the screen, there's Decidueye Zoroark. It's sort of really popped up for London, and a lot of people were talking about this deck. It was played heavily in cups. Then it really did die down. Its results, uh, there's not much to show for the deck, really. But then again, it's probably the least played Zoroark variant, so not really given too much of the chance, I think. Feather Arrow is still very strong. Having the Hollow Hunt GX attack as well can give you some help. Giving Going for Devolve plays is still very good. Obviously, the Grass typing of Decidueye becoming more and more relevant with uh, Lycan Rocks everywhere right now. So, potentially a decent archetype for you. You are taking the Sack to Greninja, which is a little bit awkward. And you still probably take the Sack to um, the Hooper Mill deck rather than the Sylveon. Sylveon's probably a good matchup for you because you have essentially infinite damage. Um, but the Wobbuffet Hooper list will definitely be bad for you. So I think its matchup spread is kind of similar to the other Zoroark variants, again, with percentage points dropping and gaining here and there, but it doesn't quite have the same consistency of the other Zoroark builds, and that's the reason why it's currently outside the top 10. Yeah, and um, finally, uh, we've got a Zoroark break in here. If you want to go down a straight Zoroark variant... Uh, I think Foul Play is a really strong attack right now, and I think Mind Jack is a really strong attack right now. People are still turn one Bridgeting, people are still turn one Brooklet Hilling, so Mind Jack is going to be doing some pretty neat one uh, one up trades. Uh, so in general, I think Zoro is this is another deck I've tried, uh, sort of quad Zoro heavy focus on the Zorak breaks and Zoro uh, on the Mind Jack Zoro arcs. Uh, Luke Kirkham, third guy from our streams, he had his list on stream yesterday. Uh, the VOD is already on YouTube, so uh, go and have a look for that. I can't I can't pinpoint where it is for you right now, uh, but just have a look through. I think he was talking about it for 20 minutes, half an hour, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. Uh, so that's a good list to start with if you want to give this one a go as well. It's another deck that's definitely under, ra under the radar and is a deck that I think can do well because it's under the radar, uh, since because the deck can do so many weird things and has so many damage multipliers and this, that, and the other. You can actually just take it knockouts out of nowhere. Um, and Zorak Break right now is still a really strong Pokemon. So in general, if you want to play a Zorak variant, uh, but don't want to play one of the three you've talked about and want to go down the heavy Mind Jack route, which I don't blame you at all for, uh, give Quad Zoro a play. Try and foul play some Crossing Cut GXs and things like that and have some fun uh, with Zorak Break instead. Yeah, I definitely think it's an interesting one because it's actually a Zoroark deck that has answers to mill better than the other two that we currently have in the format. And that's pretty much the biggest headache for me as a 
wannabe Zoroak player in Australia, the fact that you will auto lose matchups and you just don't want to go into a tournament with auto losses, uh, especially one as big as an internet. So playing a list that has the split of two mind jacks and one or two breaks means that you can foul play some really big attacks. Bulu is popular, Boswell of course being popular. Um, these are great ones to copy for a single energy, super efficient, and it's a one prize Pokemon that they have to respond on. Uh, so they put themselves to a seven prize game whilst um, losing a big attacker, and we've commit uh, only one energy, so we can then respond with maybe more Zoroarks as well in the back. So you're getting the benefits of trade, but you're using um, Zorak Break instead of maybe some of your other stage one partners, which means inherently you're a little bit weaker to prizing stuff, and it's really much more important for you to hit your evolutions on turn two. So the list needs a little bit of work, I think. Um, Luke himself said he'd make one or two changes from the list. Uh, but I think it could be one that you could mold into a very good deck that has a safety net against some of the mill. And that's definitely an appealing uh, deck for me. That's currently sort of just lingering outside the top 10. Not many people are playing it, I think, is the big deal. I think if it was to come into the limelight, it could start seeing some big results. So definitely one to keep an eye on. So that is going to be it for our top 10 list, guys. Let us know what you thought about the list. Obviously, it's based mainly on results rather than opinions. But we, of course, throw some of those in there as well into consideration when we are ranking these decks. Uh, let us know if you like the new format of the top 10 as well with the grid, with all the recent performances. I think it looks a little bit smoother to how we previously had it. And I think um, it does give you some more eye candy while we are just yabbering away. So uh, let us know if you did like it. And uh, also comment down below. What are you going to be playing for Oceana? What are you scared of? Do you think Mill will turn up? Do you think um, Buzz Rock is the best deck? Are Zoroark variants uh, starting to die out because they're being countered too much? We want to hear it all down below. Obviously, I will be going to Sydney. Uh, so if you are also going to be attending uh, come say hi it will be fantastic jack's gonna be holding the fort back here so there will be the usual stream on wednesday uh so i think that's gonna be everything is there anything to sign off on jack for you i don't think so just good luck to everyone in sydney i'm so sad i can't be there but one year in the next couple of years i'm gonna be definitely heading to australia so make sure you let us know as I, as, as joe said what you're gonna be playing what you're scared of uh, and have a great time it's gonna be a fantastic event i'm sure uh, but yeah, other than that, thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack with Joe from Omnipoke and look forward to seeing you guys in another video.